You're listening to the N2K Space Network. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. We're kicking off our daily Intel briefing with a slew of investment stories. It's the usual good, bad and ugly when it comes to the space industry. So let's start with the positive outcome and future-facing Rocket Lab, shall we? T-minus 20 seconds to LOS, T-dress, go for the floor. Today is February the 28th, 2024. I'm Alice Carruth, and this is T-Minus. Rocket Lab reports promising financial earnings. Astra founders move forward with their buyout plans. Northrop Grumman warns of layoffs in California. And our guest speaking with Maria in the second half of the show is aerospace engineer Alan Herbert. They'll be exploring African and diaspora science fiction, so stay with us for that chat. In an industry usually dominated by one provider, Rocket Lab has slowly but surely carved out their share of the profit. In fact, during the investors' call, the company's CEO talked about a backlog of contracts valued at over one billion US dollars. Yes, that was a B. Peter Beck proudly discussed the strong year that the company had experienced thanks in part to new contracts from the Space Development Agency and new Haste contracts. Rocket Lab set new launch records, conducting 10 missions with its Electron rocket last year. And moving forward, its focus will also be on developing its new vehicles, including the Neutron rocket. In terms of numbers, Rocket Lab grew revenue 16% year-on-year, with fourth-quarter revenue just shy of the $62.9 million that Wall Street expected. The company also discussed refinancing their 100 million term loan facility with Hercules Capital into a larger, longer duration and cost effective 120 million equipment lending facility with Trinity Capital. Rocket Lab's projected first quarter revenues expected between 92 million and 98 million, so we're expecting big things and great outcomes in 2024. Next up is the bad news. Astra Space founders have offered to buy the struggling company for $278 million. According to a regulatory filing, founders Chris Kemp and Adam London have proposed to acquire the small rocket maker, once valued at more than $2 billion. Shares in Astra have fallen 99.6% since the company went public in 2021, spurred by a few mission failures and delays in test flights. He is hoping that the buyer will save the company from closure and reverse the fortunes of this once promising organisation. So I guess that makes space tourism company Virgin Galactic the ugly. Sorry guys. The company had an investment call yesterday to update its fourth quarter and year-end financial results. VG touted the six human spaceflights held in 2023 as a huge success and talked of increases to its revenue, but skirted around the details of its business moving forward. They're currently going through an FAA investigation after a part fell during its January flight, and they're only expected to hold one more crewed flight this year. They say that they're planning to open a new manufacturing facility for their next generation space planes later this year. Virgin Galactic's stock took a tumble following the earnings call. Over to other news now, and Northrop Grumman has warned employees that they could be facing layoffs at their space facility in Southern California following a termination of a Space Force contract. The U.S. military branch cancelled a multi-billion dollar communications satellite program which was led by the DoD contractor. 
Northrop Grumman has said that it's working to match affected employees with existing job openings and opportunities. The company's warned that as many as 1,000 employees could be affected by the cancelled contract. Abu Dhabi's Mubadala Investment Company is expected to invest capital into artificial intelligence and space technology this year, according to its managing director. The Sovereign Wealth Fund is expected to invest more in the US and across Europe. Mubadala controls $276 billion of assets. Director Khaldun Mubarak said at a conference that, quote, we are in the business of driving progress and investing in solutions to global challenges. Well, they don't come bigger or more expensive than space, that's for sure. Indian space company Spacefills has raised $800,000 in a seed round. The Bengaluru-based company designs and builds dual-use rocket propulsion systems for aerospace, space and defence applications. The company was founded by three students who had established India's first student rocketry team at Veer Surendra Sai University of Technology. Spacefields had unveiled and tested India's first aerospike rocket engine in 2023. It also filed six patents on technologies developed in-house. The company currently employs only 12 people full-time. The funding will be used to grow the workforce. SpaceX is in hot water with the US federal government over allegedly withholding service of its military-focused Starshield system for US troops in and around Taiwan. Starshield is a program that SpaceX launched in December 2022 to provide secure satellite internet access to the military and government agencies. US Representative Mike Gallagher sent a letter to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk to say he's learned from multiple sources that Starshield is inactive in and around Taiwan, despite a contract with the Pentagon to serve US troops in the region. SpaceX and Musk have not publicly responded to the letter from Gallagher. And we finish our briefing with a story from the Army. Colonel Frank Rubio has been awarded the Army astronaut device during a pinning ceremony at the Pentagon. The Army awards the astronaut device to personnel who complete at least one operational mission in space. With the award, Rubio joins Colonel Anne McLean and Colonel Andrew Morgan as the only active duty soldiers authorised to wear the device. Rubio spent 371 days aboard the International Space Station from 2022 to 2023, breaking the record for the longest space flight for an American astronaut. You'll find links to further reading on all the stories I've mentioned in this episode in our show notes, and I've added a few extra. A great piece from Ars Technica on Odysseus's technical issues and appointment announcements from NASA. Hey T-Minus crew, if you find this podcast useful, please do us a favor and share a five-star rating and a short review in your favorite podcast app. It will help other space professionals like you find the show and join the T-Minus crew. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Our guest today is aerospace engineer and agri-food advocate, Alan Herbert. Maria spoke with Alan about how science fiction influenced his career. I always tell people my STEM was lost in space, Star Trek, and in space 1999. Um, I wanted to be Scotty, you know. I mean, lost in space, I thought I was supposed to be a physicist like uh, Dr. Robinson. But when I saw Star Trek for the first time, I said, oh, I want to be an engineer, aerospace engineer. I had never heard of it in a school. I grew up in Berkeley, of all places, in Los Angeles. Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California. Yes. And there was no STEM program in my elementary or junior high school. So I I figured all this out myself. And here I am, an aerospace engineer, working with agri-food development. Last time we talked for the show, we were talking a bit about, like, what you were doing when you were, uh, like, the last four years to now about agri-food. But let's let's go back a little bit further when we talk about like sci-fi and what that introduced to you and also like th- that, that spark that it, it, it ignited in you. <laughs> I mean, it, it ignited the spark to really look deeper. And that's why I'm an aerospace engineer. But years and years ago, um, I remember reading, oh, it was a documentary of Toni Morrison. She's an um, African-American 
writer. And she said, if there's a book that you cannot find that you would like, write it yourself. <laughs> and so I started writing African science fiction. Basically back then, I was, I don't want to age myself, but that was almost 40 years ago. Yeah, um, we, we can edit the age out. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. No, don't do that. And so, um, so I started writing again. My wife encouraged me. So I started writing again. But if I wasn't a person in the vacuum, it started, um, history is so very important. I mean, it is one of the most important things. I love history. I have an uncle that taught um, African history at San Francisco State in the 70s. And so that sparked me too. So even when I started writing, you start looking at, okay, in terms of African-Americans, even Africans, who was writing before, obviously before me, of course. And so you start learning that even at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a woman named Pauline Hopkins who wrote a book about a hidden advanced African civilization in Ethiopia. Sound familiar? And this is 1906. Okay. Gee, I wonder if a certain comic book <laughs> series got inspired from that. Yeah, like. <laughs> and so this is, well, 1902, I'm sorry, 1902. And so and then W.E. Du Bois, a lot of people heard of him. He wrote a science fiction book called Comet about a comet hitting Earth, which was very interesting. I did not know he wrote science fiction. Yes, he did. Yes, what? He did. <laughs> wow. Okay, I went I went to UMass. He spent a lot of time at UMass. So like our our library is named after him, so he's a big deal. So I did not I did not know. Okay, you just, just that's really cool. Didn't that's know that. That's why we're talking. Oh, and then <laughs> And then there's a guy named George Schuler. He was in the Harlem Renaissance. He wrote in the 1930s a uh, fictionalized African civilization uh, called the Black Empire. Again, almost like Wakanda. <laughs> then we have mid-20th century Samuel R. Delaney. A lot of people, uh, he wrote for even TV stuff. So he was a very big writer back then. And then, of course, we all know Octavia Butler, Kindred. She, I mean, that's only one, but she wrote many science fiction books um, as a woman back in 1979. Her stories, one of them was a miniseries on FX. And so she has a big impact. And then... You know, you come into today, you have Nola Hopkins, N.K. Jameson, Needy Okafor. I mean, they mix a lot of Black identity and um, art and different things in, the, in their stories, even African um, mythology and things in there, and even in their own stories, and with even advanced uh, civilization. And then um, uh, there's some African ones, Ben Okri from Nigeria, Lauren Bukes from South Africa, one of my favorites is uh, Stephen Barnes. Not a lot of people have heard of him. He wrote a book called Lion's Blood, and he's written some Star Wars things. But his book, Lion's Blood, was, was an alternate history as if um, West Africa came to America and they brought slaves from Europe. So it was a, <laughs> it's a very different. It's called Lion's Blood, and there was another one called Zulu. So he did two stories. And he also has written like I said, for Star Wars and different things. And so he's done a lot of different things and a lot of people hadn't heard of him. And then, um, then there's more younger people, which I love when younger people write science fiction because they, they have the internet, they have a whole different perspective than someone such as Octavia Butler, where she looked at technology different. So there's um, a young lady out of uh, London, she's African, called Timmy O. And it's, this wasn't really an African story, but it was uh, African writing about, it's called Terra 2, and it's about a group of teenagers, six teenagers going to a new um, earth. So that was a good one. And then there's a guy named Momo Batran. Recently, he wrote a book about Africans going to Mars. And what's so amazing, Maria, is that people want to see themselves in things. And I remember again, um, old science fiction movies didn't have that many black people that like the 50s, 40s. In the 60s, they started it. I remember I was watching Destination Space. I don't know if you heard of this, a 1950s. I've heard of it. I've heard yeah. of it. I won't say I've seen it, but I've heard of it, yeah. And yeah. wow, there's one black guy in it who's on the space station. And so it really didn't happen until uh, Outer Limits and then, of course, Star Trek. But a lot of people looked at Aurora, which she was amazing, but I wanted to be Scotty. As I keep saying. You mentioned seeing yourself and, and your your stories reflected. And to me, it's also when humanity continues our exploration of 
the cosmos. We've got to bring our whole selves into it. All our experiences inform who we are. And, you know, what does it mean to have a story about, like, black people on the moon? Well, I mean, for me, it's like Toni Morrison said. I mean, I, I like Ben Bova, Alistair Reynolds, and, and Kim Stanley Robinson. And then some of I read some of the um, ones that they consider Afrofuturism, and some that may not be. I said, you know, but I want to read something that I really, really would like. And so I started writing myself. And as I was saying, I, I, I wrote the first story when I was in college. It was called Darkest Europe. And then I started writing in like three different categories, Maria. I looked at Earth, space, and time travel. I love time travel shows. The Earth ones, one of them talks about the, the first African uh, man rocket that goes to, into space. This is more... It would be more today, you know, not way in the future. I hope not. But it talks about that, a young kid doing that. And then I write, then on Earth, also children's books looking at agri-food development, space agriculture, food in space, basically, for young people. Um, and then I look at space. I lived in the Mesa region, Middle East, Africa, and South Asia for four years, where I lived in Abu Dhabi. And so I started writing with the characters from that region, because by the year 2100, two out of three people in the world will be in that region. And that region is really growing. You know, a lot of things are going on technology-wise that a lot of people don't know. So I wrote a book called Sustainable Frontiers that I'm writing. Not a book, I'm sorry, a short story. It's about uh, a ship that goes out looking at redoing organic waste. I mean, all those different things. But the crew is made up of mostly the people from the Mesa region. So it's, it's not... It's not just Africa, but it's people from that whole region. And then I have one of my favorite ones. Um, I think I told you a little bit about it earlier, about a moon base uh, uh, election. It's African, basically. And so these are the different things that, you know, excite me. And even in the time travel sense, I, I start writing. As I got older, I started um, reading more African history because of my uncle. My uncle was a um, professor at San Francisco State that talked about, he, 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 um, he taught African history. And one of them, one of them, of course, is Darkest Europe. And then I have another one about Queen Amanoreus, who, this is real, who stopped the Romans from going deeper into Africa. After they conquered Egypt, she, she stopped them from going into deeper into Africa, basically. And then I have some about black colleges in the 1920s. So I, I so I, I kind of had a mixture in there where it's adventure, but it's also learning pretty much. And a lot of them are short stories, also writing a, a book, something I started almost 14 years ago, but I just didn't finish. <laughs> finish. So I, it's just, this is something that always motivated me. I'm, I'm a big science fiction person, um, uh, for TV, any shows that come on, any some of the science fiction stuff on TV or at the movies, I don't. I'm one of these people. I critique it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I, a science fiction fan critiquing sci-fi. I've never heard of that, Alan. <laughs> we none and of us so, have opinions, especially strong ones. <laughs> yeah, and so you realize a lot of these stories. They were short stories. Even Star Trek. A lot of them were sto short stories that people have written. Um, I mean, I started really researching them, um, Outer Limits, all these different things. These stories, series were all short stories from somebody. So there was an impact there. So I write for that so that people have a different perspective. I hope they're in an African-American community or any community, especially the African-American community now, that the younger people start writing. You know, and we already have a lot of writers. There's some writers for science fiction shows. They look at TV and, and movies and all these different things. And so I'm very excited about the future. We talked about offline that I forgot to ask. I should have asked earlier and maybe what at this earlier is we were talking about like my extremely undereducated understanding of like Afrofuturism versus like African-American sci-fi sci stories. And you had given me this gorgeous distinction between how I was confusing them all. Would you mind sort of indulging me and in just explaining those concepts again? Because I'm sure I'm not the only person who's like, I, I think of Afrofuturism as, as, a, as a bubble, and it, that's not correct. No, I mean, it's, it's encompassing, but not all-encompassing. 
if you look for the definition of Afrofuturism, you can look it up in, in the internet. It expresses Black identity. I think I talked about that agency and freedom through art, culture. And then even the, it, it, the word didn't really come up until the 1970s. There was a guy named Sun Ra. Um, if you, oh, uh, yeah. Okay, if you remember oh, Parliament, yeah. if you remember Parliament, uh, Funkadelics, all these, LaBelle, they had these futuristic clothes and all that. So it encompassed not just writing and things like that. It encompassed um, art. It encompassed uh, movement, dance. It encompasses everything dealing in an African and African uh, a diaspora um, context, basically. And so it was a response to not being involved, not being seeing black people in the future. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Because yep. sometimes you see these futuristic movies and it's like, we don't exist. And they're supposed to be the year 2312 or this and that. And it's like, we don't exist. But this was a, a reaction to it. But now here we have Black Panther, which is they look at it as Afrofuturism, which is, you know, it has affected so many people. be right back. Welcome back. A team of researchers in Korea recreated the moon's dusty, electrically charged environment right here on Earth. They built a contraption straight out of a sci-fi flick, a Korean electrostatic environment simulator, or KEYS, to mimic those lunar conditions. Yes, it's not new news. We've certainly seen a few of those kicking around the US, but it is a first for South Korea. The team created the keys to test how moon dust behaves when astronauts inevitably track it back to their spaceships. That crazy regolith gets everywhere, so someone had to figure out how to deal with it. Who wants to vacuum up moon dust for the next century? That's it for T-minus for February the 28th, 2024. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. This episode was mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Carth. Our host, Maria Valmazis, will hopefully be back on the mic in the coming days. I'm Alice Carruth, and thanks for listening. Listener.